Hello and welcome back to Ordinary Differential Equations, the video series where we talk a lot about the theory of differential equations. And indeed, in today's part 12, we will finally prove an existence result. More precisely, we will discuss the famous Picard-Lindelöf theorem. This is a classical result, which is applicable for a lot of differential equations. However, before we start with the statement here, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. Please check the link in the description to see how you can support me and free mathematical education videos. And I can tell you, as a bonus, you get PDF versions, quizzes and other stuff for all the videos. Ok, then let's start with the video by stating the common initial value problem again. This is simply a system of differential equations together with the starting value. So we write it as x dot is equal to v and x of 0 is equal to the starting value x0. And now the important ingredient for the Pika-Lindelöf theorem is that our function v here is a locally Lipschitz continuous one. Because this implies that indeed we find a unique solution for this initial value problem. So you see, this is exactly what we want to talk about today. However, please note that the uniqueness we have already proven in a former video, so here we only have to talk about the existence of a solution. And exactly this we can prove by using the so-called Banach fixed point theorem. This one we have discussed in the last video, so let's simply recall that we need a complete metric space here and a so-called contraction. And then we can conclude that this map phi has a fixed point in the metric space X. And exactly this should give us the existence of a solution for our ordinary differential equation. Hence, in order to apply this nice general theorem here, we have to state two things first. Namely, we have to say what is our metric space x here and what is our contraction phi. So more precisely, first we need to define a complete metric space consisting of functions. The elements should be functions because in the end our fixed point here should be a solution of the ordinary differential equation. And this is obviously a function from r into rn. And then the second ingredient here is that we can write down a contraction that sends functions to functions. And indeed the definition for phi we already know from the last video. So let's say we put in the function alpha, then phi of alpha at the time point t is given by the initial value x0 plus the integral from 0 to t of the function v where we put in our function alpha now. In fact, as we have shown in the last video, a fixed point of this map phi is exactly a solution of our initial value problem. This is the important statement that tells us that this map phi is exactly the one we want to find solutions. However, this also means that we have to show that phi is a contraction in order to apply Banner's fixed point theorem. Therefore, the first step now is to write down the corresponding metric space here. And we already know it has to be a function space with a metric. Ok, and since we want to have solutions of differential equations, we can consider continuous functions. More precisely, continuous functions from r into rn. However, there you also already know that solutions of differential equations don't have to exist on the whole real number line. The time interval for the solution can definitely be smaller. Hence, we can also say we only care about a local solution, so we restrict ourselves to this interval minus epsilon to epsilon. And in addition we say epsilon has to be as small as we need it to be. And then we map into Rn or more precisely, we have to map into the domain of v. Ok, so these are the functions we want to consider and they should have two properties. First, they should be continuous functions and they should fulfill the initial value. This means alpha at the point of time 0 
is equal to x0. Okay, so there you see, this is the whole description of the functions we want to consider. However, it's not a metric space yet. So what we have to add is a distance function, a metric d. This is more or less standard because we can use the so-called supremum norm to define this metric d. This means if we have two functions alpha and beta here, we can measure the distance by taking the supremum over all possible inputs t here of the distance of alpha t and beta t. So we take the difference in the values of the functions and we take the biggest one of these. Hence, this implies that we have to transform this difference here into a distance as well. And this we can do by using the norm in Rn. In other words, we know how to measure distances here on the right hand side in Rn. And of course, here we can simply use the standard Euclidean norm. So indeed, this is not complicated at all. We can just measure the distance between these two values here. In order to remember this definition here, you can always do a sketch and just put the graphs of the function in. And please recall, we only have to consider an interval minus epsilon to epsilon here. And then you should see we have the graph of the function alpha and the graph of the function beta. And now what we do is that for each point t, we just measure the distance of the values at this point t. In other words, we have a lot of distances here and then we simply take the supremum at the end. And this supremum is what we call the distance between alpha and beta. Okay, and now the important fact you can remember is that this space xd is indeed a complete metric space. While saying this, I noticed a small mistake here because you can see the supremum norm is not defined for unbounded functions in our space x. This is not a problem because we are interested in the bounded functions anyway. We are interested in the solutions of the initial value problem and they will not explode if epsilon is small enough. So the additional property boundedness is not a problem for us, but now it makes the whole space x into a complete metric space. We don't have to prove that here because you can find it in my functional analysis course or my real analysis course. But please remember this important fact. This here defines a nice metric and together with the set we have a complete space. And there you should recall it means that every Cauchy sequence is a convergent one. Okay, with that we can conclude that we have the first ingredient of the Banach fixed point theorem. Therefore, we can go to the second point and show that our function phi is a contraction in this space. And the first thing we should note is that this phi we want to consider is indeed a map from x into x again. Of course, this is also important. The outcome of this map phi has to be an element in x again. And here we immediately see that it's a continuous function with the initial value x0. Therefore, we only have to show the contraction property. Roughly, this means the distance between two outputs is less than the distance of the two inputs. In other words, we have to produce an inequality here. But first, again, let's write down the definition of the distance of the two outputs here. In other words, here inside the standard norm of Rn, we find the values of this function here. So this means we have this integral inside the standard norm here. And moreover, you also immediately see that the starting value here just cancels. Hence, we only have this integral inside. And more precisely, in the integral, we simply have v of alpha and v of beta. And at this point, we can use a standard inequality, which is often called triangle inequality. It tells us if we pull the norm into the integral, then we cannot get smaller. This means we have a less or equal sign here. And then we have the same integral, but now with the norm inside. 
So indeed, not so complicated, but very helpful. Because now we can roughly estimate this integral here. And please note, it's an ordinary real valued integral. Therefore, it's simply the area between the graph of the function and the x-axis. And this one is indeed bounded by a rectangle. It's the length of the interval here times the height given by the maximal value of the function. In other words, here we have to take the supremum of the values again. Okay, so let's write this down. We have the length of the interval given from 0 to t times the supremum of everything inside. This means we also have s going from 0 to t. So maybe this looks more complicated than it is because it's simply this area of the rectangle. Okay, and now the first thing we can simplify here is that the length of this interval here is simply given by the absolute value of t. And there we know this is definitely smaller than epsilon because t goes from minus epsilon to epsilon. And also the second factor here becomes only bigger if we increase the interval for s. So we also have less or equal here if we write supremum of s from minus epsilon to epsilon. Now if we do both things here, you see we get rid of our variable t and therefore also of the supremum in front. Hence everything looks a little bit simpler now because we only have less or equal than epsilon times this supremum here. So we did all of that because you know in the end we want to have the distance function d between alpha and beta again. And in fact we are almost there because now we only have to put in our Lipschitz condition. So in conclusion we know there is a constant L such that we have an inequality here as well. So this is exactly our local Lipschitz continuity of the function v. Therefore on the right hand side here we only have the difference of alpha of s minus beta of s. And as always measured in the standard norm of Rn. Okay and with that we have it because now we see we have our original distance d again. Namely we have epsilon times l times distance between alpha and beta. And now you should know we have a contraction if the constant in front of this distance is less than 1. And now you should see this is always possible because we can choose epsilon small enough. And that's exactly the idea, just make epsilon smaller to push this constant below 1. Okay, very nice. With that we have all the ingredients for the Banach fixed point theorem. And now we can apply it to our initial value problem. And indeed this proves the existence of solutions, so everything we want, it proves the pika lindeler theorem. So for the end of the video let's write down the statement of this nice theorem. So what we have here is a locally Lipschitz continuous function v and we already know the domain could be smaller. So let's say the domain is u in Rn. And then we know the initial value x0 also has to come from this u. Okay and now we have proven under these assumptions we find an epsilon greater than 0 and a unique solution we can call alpha of our initial value problem. And exactly this statement we can prove with the Banner fixed point theorem is what we call the pika lindelof theorem. Indeed it can be generalized but still it's nice that you get such a strong result just by using the Banach fixed point theorem. Therefore this is definitely something you should remember for this series and we will discuss that in more detail with the next videos. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you.